A few years ago, Ryan Bell was just your ordinary, run-of-the-mill, Seventh-day Adventist pastor, but he made waves in the atheist community in January of 2014 when he embarked on a year without God, which he documented on his blog. Now, since announcing this decision, he's become a sought-after speaker at atheist and secular conventions. His journey is the subject of an upcoming documentary. He's the host of the brand-new podcast, Life After God, and he's also our guest tonight. Ryan, welcome to The Scathing Atheist. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, before we get to the interview proper, I have a bit of a mea culpa. So the listeners that have been with us for a while might recall hearing your name around episode 48, would have been January of 2014. You were actually the lead story in our one-year anniversary episode, and I hope you're flattered by that because the rest of this isn't as flattering. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm super flattered. All right, good, good. Glad it, to know. Hit me it. with the rest of it. All right, so now I should say in advance that when I read your initial blog post and the coverage about it, I got the impression that this was less about reexamining your own faith and more about trying to see how the other half lived. And I should also warn you that when I got into this business, Hemet already had the friendly angle covered, so I had to go a different way. So <laughs> with all of that in mind, I want to read you a quick excerpt from episode 48 where I referred to your efforts as, quote, well-intentioned but silly, since the only prerequisite and, in fact, the only feature of atheism is not believing in God, and if he isn't going to do that, then this is largely an exercise in celibate masturbation. <laughs> My slightly less reserved co-host Heath compared it to, quote, a white person trying out being black for a year by dancing better. <laughs> so, But now you're here to defend yourself, so tell me, what did we get wrong? What did it mean to you to go a year without God? Oh my gosh, that's so great. I, first of all, congratulations. That was a brilliant critique. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and when, when I started out, I, I really didn't have a clue what I was doing. So, you know, I, I didn't know that there was a atheist community per se, or that there were mm -hmm. blogs and podcasts and all the rest. I, I was really just at the end of my rope in a way. I had been a, a pastor, as you said, for an nearly 20 years, and I was let go from my position as a pastor because I had become little by little too liberal for that denomination, which mm -hmm. was Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then I basically came to the end of 2013 and thought, I, I don't know which way to go here, and I think maybe there's not a God. And I've sort of had intuitions about that in the past, but kind of put them on the top shelf so I didn't have to worry about them. And now I feel like I need to worry about them. So I, I really started that year in an effort to try to examine my own faith, but also to really figure out what is atheism? No, I, I guess I already dropped the, the title of your new podcast, so that spoils the suspense, but your year without God was over nine months ago. So where are you now in terms of the big G-O-D? Well, at the end of 2014, I announced that I didn't think there was reason to believe in God. And I sort of said, well, at that point, I, I, I feel like I'm an atheist. I'm, I'm what I suppose you could say an agnostic atheist. I, I don't know that I know for sure that there's no God or that any of us can know for sure. But I think as a matter of probability, it's, it's highly unlikely that there's a God, which I think qualifies me as an atheist. Um, I'm, you know, I would also consider myself a humanist because I think that's what's left from being, you know, after being a conscientious Christian and losing the supernatural part, I think what's left at the end is, is, is humanism as um, really caring about people, caring about the earth and all living things and trying our best to live as as good you know ethical human beings um so so that's that's kind of where i'm at now now it sounds to me like and, and i might just be misinterpreting this but it sounds to me like you were almost afraid going into this that you were going to lose that humanism that you were going to lose that desire to help other people and that like that almost like you felt that that came from your religion is that an accurate assessment or am i just reading that in no, I think that's right. I, I, I don't know that I would have said it quite that clearly at the time, but I did learn my ethical viewpoints from Christianity, and I don't think it's necessary to learn them from Christianity, but that's how I learned mine. I, I, right. I learned to be honest and fair and kind and loving and compassionate from being a Christian. Not everyone learns that from being a Christian, by the way, as, as you well know. But I, I did learn my ethics from being a Christian. And so I think I probably assumed that religion was in some sense 
essential or necessary for being an ethical person. Although I did know people, plenty of people who were good ethical people without being Christian. So that was the beginning of the cognitive dissonance maybe is, is knowing that not everyone who is a good person in the world is necessarily a person of faith. And so, you know, what do we do about that? What do we, how do we, you know, account for that? Right. And of course, on the flip side, as you already mentioned, not everyone of faith is a good person. either. Correct. So. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Now, obviously, I've already admitted that Heath and I were more than a little skeptical when we first heard about this. But setting us aside, uh, what kind of reaction did you get from the atheist community at large? I mean, it was mixed. I mean, it's, it, I think Hemet Meta sort of almost uh, epitomizes the reaction because the first day his blog post was to the, to the former pastor who's trying on atheism, you're doing it wrong. I think that, right. was, that mm -hmm. was the title of his blog post. Two days later, he was raising money for me. So I, it was like, okay, I guess. Uh, and see, my reaction to Hemet was to say, I wrote a blog post and said, well, this guy says I'm doing it wrong. So I'm starting this effort to learn. So please tell me, how am I doing it wrong? And I didn't mean that sarcastically at all. I really meant like, well, apparently I'm doing it wrong. Uh, I've been told by the Christians that I've been doing Christianity wrong all of my life. So <laughs> apparently now I'm doing atheism wrong. So please, somebody help me, you know, figure out what I'm doing wrong. And I, and again, I didn't mean that in a kind of a fuck you kind of way. I, I really meant it in a, in a like, okay, so maybe I am. I mean, I'm new to this. I'm doing it wrong. So please tell me what, what I'm doing, what I'm doing wrong. And, and people have been super awesome about it. I mean, I think some people rightly corrected some things that I had uh, probably started with some wrong assumptions and premises that weren't necessarily factual or accurate and uh, helped me straighten that out. Um, I think the most common one that I continue to encounter in my own life now is this idea that to be an atheist, you have to know that God doesn't exist. You have to have been able to prove it, that God doesn't mm -hmm. exist, you know, that the burden of proof rests on atheists rather than on Christians who are making the claim that God does exist. And I, I think I inadvertently sort of fell into that. Like, I don't know that I have enough confidence to be, a, be an atheist. And people, you know, fairly kindly and quickly said to me, you don't need to have that kind of confidence to be an atheist. All you need to do is really say to yourself, I don't have enough evidence to believe that there is a God, and that's all it really is. Yeah, I actually have yet to uh, encounter a non-agnostic atheist in my life. So now, obviously, I, I would imagine that the flip side of that question has a very similar answer. I would imagine that the reaction from the religious community was rather mixed as well. It was. You know, my closest friends who are fairly agnostic Christians uh, were encouraging. You know, they said, this is great. You need to explore your beliefs. And I wish I had the courage to do it. And, you know, more power to you. The the really vitriolic Christians were people I didn't know personally, people from the inter Internet or from, you know, conservative circles, which I wasn't really that close to. But there was, you know, some some outrage and uh, William Lane Craig took his shots and uh, who's the guy with the banana? Um, Comfort, Ray Comfort. Yeah, Ray Comfort had a whole ser a whole show on his TV vi video program that focused on how stupid I was and all that, which I sort of at that point took as a badge of honor. I thought, wow, they're talking, yeah. they're talking about me in this really ridiculous way. And um, they, they will, those, some of those, the Ray Comfort clips will be in the documentary for sure. It's, it's pretty, pretty great footage. And the William Lane Craig show, what's his thing called? Rational Belief. Uh, reasonable Faith. Reason I yeah, Reasonable Faith. He, he did two shows about me and I wrote to him. He, I mean, of course he totally misconstrued everything I was up to. And, uh, so I wrote to the show a couple of times and, asked if I could be on the show and actually have a conversation with him about what I was doing. And of course that wasn't possible. You know, you're not educated enough to talk to him. See, he only talks to people with three PhDs or more or something along those lines. That's that, that's at least the line he uses on Dillahunty anyway. Right, right. He only wants to and you know, and then Dawkins won't debate him for good reason. And, and uh, he doesn't want to debate the, the lowly, uh, uneducated folks, you know, or whatever. So Right, the people that actually would debate them. So now, obviously, the, the, the uh, question that everybody wants to know is, is what did you learn from all of this? And that, I, I'm sure that is an enormous question, but I kind of want to break it down into three parts, and one of them we've already touched on. So first, what did your year without God teach you about atheism? 
Hmm, that's a really good question. One thing I think I learned is that it's as diverse as any other group of people. So if anybody thinks that there are atheists, and by atheists, you know, we all sort of march to some similar kind of drum, you know, that that's mm-hmm. simply not true. But at the bottom of it all, we we all want to know if we're honest with ourselves, we want to know the truth. And that quest for the truth is um is something that I, I find really appealing about about atheists. Um so I don't know. I, I'm surp- I was surprised at how many internal fights atheists have, which reminded me a great deal of the church, actually, and the way that we have fights over how what the Eucharist means is right. It, you know, like no. Oh you, wow, are we that bad? I, I mean, we haven't we haven't started any wars over our no our struggles, as far as I know. But no, it's mostly it's mostly just you know Twitter wars. You know, it's not uh, yeah, actual well, yeah. wars. <laughs> <laughs> over whether or not that Down syndrome baby should be born at all. Yeah, I gotcha. Right, right, so, right. <laughs> so now the obvious part, uh, second part to that question is, is what what did uh, going a year without God teach you about religion? Boy, you know, it is it is hard to say. And I feel like religion is a powerful tool which can be put to good and bad uses. And I just know too many Christians, some very, very personal friend, close friends of mine who put their religion to good uses. And I, I realize that means that they're being highly selective about the Bible and they're being highly selective about their theology. And yet they draw a great deal of good out of their religious convictions. And then there are, of course, w- w- without even needing to explain it, plenty of people who use their religion for horrible ends um, from ISIS on down. And, and so it's just such a mixed bag, I find. And it's sort of like, I, I've likened it to fire, you know, fire can warm you and cook your food and keep you alive in a storm. And it can also burn your house down and burn you. So it's, da- mm-hmm. it's dangerous, you know, it's, it's dangerous. And even when I was a pastor, I said, you know, religion is dangerous. It's not to be treated lightly. It's certainly has been used for horrible ends. Um, so I, I guess I'm a bit agnostic about the virtues or not of religion. Well, no, I, I will say that's a great analogy, but where the analogy breaks down is that fire is necessary. You know, there's no other way of achieving sometimes that the warming of the house other than fire. Mm. Whereas, you know, most of the benefits, or I would, I would argue all of the benefits of religion can be achieved through humanism, through philosophy, through other means. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean... That, you know, it, it'll still keep your house warm, but there are, I think, these other methods of doing the same thing that don't lend themselves to burning the house down. I agree. I, I think for me, I, I, I tend to think contextually, and I guess another way of saying that is historically about most things. And if we look at the history of morality and religion, um, we find that ethics evolved religiously and then in recent times, we've sort of not needed the supernatural stick or carrot, I suppose. Um, and we've just sort of understood in more humanistic and rational terms what is, you know, for the greater good and what is not. And of course, we have still have robust debates about, you know, what really is best. But you're right. I don't think we need religion to be good moral people. Uh, I certainly hope not. Um, because none of yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, we we certainly can't agree on which one it is that would make us the most good or moral. So even if religion were, I mean, if religion were the basis of morality, we would really be in a pickle because everybody has a different one, you know. So it's 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 just not, you know. Every time someone says that to me, I repeat something that I heard uh, from Michael Shermer say in a in an interview I did with him. Uh, after his book, The Moral Arc, came out. And, you know, he very simply said, and I thought it was so well put in such simple terms, we all arrive at our morality the same way. We reason about it. We, mm-hmm. think, we think about it. We, we think, huh, what should I do in this situation? And we draw on history and past experiences and empirical research and all sorts of things to decide 
you know, should we keep this person on life support or should we let them die? You know, or, or should we force this person to stay alive or should we let them choose to die on their own if they choose? You know, like all these kinds mm-hmm. of ethical questions. And when people challenge me about it, I say, well, you certainly didn't learn your morality from the Bible because your morality exceeds that of the Bible. So you actually, even if it began with the Bible, which I, I, I would concede many people's morality like my own began with the Bible – uh, or at least it began with the idea of what the Bible should be, and that, that was a very good correction that you made there. It was yeah, saving you the trouble because I, I, I just I actually just read the book of Timothy there, so I was about to jump in and say, "Hey, wait a minute!" But no, you 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 corrected yourself. Yeah, no, no, I think yeah, because I think what we learn is not so much the Bible, but we learn an idealized image of what the Bible mm-hmm. we expect the Bible to be, and when you begin to actually examine it, you realize that it's not exactly what we ex- have expected to find and that we in the case of for example of you know the the very common case of slavery if you know if you don't keep slaves which i assume most of your listeners don't keep slaves um you didn't learn that from the bible you learned that from thinking about it right. and and talking to other people and by talking to other people i mean like learning from history and in history people collectively decided you know, over, you know, it took too long and too much debate, but eventually we decided, look, this isn't right. We, mm-hmm. we, we don't own other people. And, and, but we didn't learn that from the Bible. No, no. And like you said, we didn't learn it at all for a really long time somehow. So now just kind of bring this all around to a close. And again, I, I apologize because these are huge questions that I'm asking and we don't have a whole lot of time left. But we've already learned what, uh, or we've already asked what you learned about atheism and what you learned about religion. I, I guess most importantly, what did the year without God teach you about Ryan Bell? Oh boy, um, that's a yeah. These are great questions. I I think I learned a lot about the capacity that people have to hold contradictory evidence, intention, and not feel the need to resolve it. Because what struck me was that for years I suspected that evolution was the explanation for how we are, you know, arrived in our current state. Mm -hmm. But I was not allowed to say that from the pulpit. Other colleagues of mine in science departments and Adventist colleges had been fired for even suggesting that evolution might be true or that they were rumored to be teaching evolution to their students. And in my mind, I thought, well, you know, every time I'd watch Jon Stewart and he would make fun of some you know, evolu- a creationist, whatever, or, you know, it would come up in the cult. Oh, what do I know? And, right. and I would just sort of put it on the back burner, you know? And what I learned about myself is that I have a remarkable capacity, probably like most people, to compartmentalize my thinking and to hold contradictory uh, evidence and not feel a particular burden to resolve it all the time. And, and that, and that eventually leads to cognitive dissonance that's unbearable. And then people begin to say, now, hold on a second. I can't anymore live with these two ideas in my head at the same time. I have to let one go. That's a remarkably honest introspection. It's one of those things that's very easy to see in other people. Yeah. You know, it takes a lot more to see it in yourself. What we need is that electronic monk from Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. If we just had that. <laughs> so, now, I, I've only got you for a few more minutes here. We haven't talked about your new podcast yet, uh, Life After God. So my first question about that, obviously, is why you got to be stepping on our turf, man. Me and Heath have been here in the podcasting thing for years. We don't need any help. Respect, respect to you guys. Oh, okay. All right. Well, in that case, no, I'm obviously I'm kidding. I'm always happy to see new podcasts popping up, but there are quite a few atheist podcasts now. So what, what did you think that you could offer the podcast listening world that wasn't already out there? You know, the goal in Life After God is a podcast, but it's also more than that. I mean, what we're trying to do... Uh, And I have a few friends that are helping me with this, Um, notably Greta Vosper, the United Church of Canada minister who has been an atheist for over 10 years. And her congregation is sort of theism optional. What we're trying to do is hold a space. It's sort of like I've been I've been trying to think of the appropriate analogy for this. It's sort of like a decompression chamber. So it's, it's a space between belief and unbelief. And I know that 
atheists would probably say you either believe or you don't. There's no in between. But but I and I sort of I understand what what they mean people mean when they say that. But but I would also argue that there is this space where people are like, I don't know what to call myself. I don't feel comfortable thinking of myself as a Christian or a believer. But I also mm-hmm. don't quite feel comfortable yet saying I'm an atheist because I have all these questions about how does it all fit? Why is there something and not nothing? And why is the universe seem so perfectly fine tuned? And I need to explore all these things. And yet I know the Bible can't be perfectly true either. And I'm just in this middle of this space of unknowing and life after God is the goal is to hold that space for people. We're offering coaching for individuals who need a, or want a, someone to just kind of walk with them through that process and give them some critical thinking tools and some just guidance in terms of maybe what to read or how to think about a certain kind of problem without an agenda for their life. Cause the church has an agenda for your life. You know, they, you know, they mm-hmm. say like God has a plan for your life and so do we. And so the last thing I want to do is to say, I have a plan for somebody's life, but sometimes people would like a companion, you know, to, to walk with on that deconversion thing. So my podcast is designed to bring people to the microphone who are either on one side or the other of that sort of middle ground, but who are keenly sensitive to that middle space that are, are saying like, this is, this is the complexity. This is, you know, what it's like to deconvert. I, I anticipate sharing lots of stories of deconversion and what it was like for people. Cause I find that people that are deconverting when they hear stories of deconversion, they go, Oh yes, that's exactly how I feel. Well, and I think, too, like, you know, for people like myself that never had religion, it's super useful to have an opportunity. You know, it's very hard for me to step into the into the shoes of a believer, because like like you say, for me, it's a binary thing. Either you believe in God or you don't. This middle ground doesn't make any sense to me. And I know that through reading your blog and now hopefully through uh, listening to your podcast as well, that's afforded me an opportunity to understand, you know, these people that I meet every day in a way that I I never was uh, able to before. So I thank you for that. Well, and I I actually think, you know, I was thinking about this just this evening on my drive home. I thought, I really believe that critical thinking will lead people the right way, whatever the right way is. I think if you think critically about things and you're deeply honest and courageous, I don't have to manipulate anyone into believing something. It's not a sales job. It's simply providing a safe space for people to ask the questions that they already have in their minds. I don't have to give them the questions. People that are honestly questioning the world, they have the questions already. It's almost like what I needed was permission to ask those questions. And for years I had been told by my church and my denomination and my employer, you're not allowed to ask those questions. You're not allowed to go. Mm -hmm. You can't go there. And the minute I wasn't employed by them anymore, I thought, well, damn it, I can go there. Like I can ask those questions now. And when I started asking those questions, the rest sort of took care of itself. And I I really feel like people will find freedom, whatever freedom looks like for them, if they just have that space. And so that's the kind of thing I'm trying to do. Awesome. Well, for whatever it's worth, I want you to know that I am on my 39th consecutive year without God. And in my experience, it just gets better as you go. So you've got a lot to look forward to, sir. That's incredible, man. I'm, I'm working on year two. So I got a little catching up to do, but <laughs> right, I, right. I think it's, uh, it's, been, it's been great. Right on. And of course, if you want to check out Ryan's new show, you can check out lifeaftergod.org. You can find it on iTunes, or you can follow the handy link on the show notes for this episode at scathingatheist.com. We will also have a link to his blog there as well. Ryan, thanks again for joining us tonight. Uh, Thanks, Noah. Appreciate it so much. You bet, man. Good luck going forward.